Hello. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Awesome. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes, I saw your life earlier today. You've got a busy uh, schedule on today. I did. So today I had, an, I'm not a clinically assigned, and I usually go to work anyway, uh, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to do some work from home and do a couple of lives, and here we are. That's awesome. Well, yeah, so thank you. you. I know you're busy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause for a second and then redo the, do the introduction because, you know, I use this for uh, yep. a podcast. Okay, so here we go. Okay, I'm Dr. Shannon Clark with Babies After 35 on Instagram and at a, a, a Dr. Deliver's podcast. And I'm joined today by Dr. Prim Fort, neonatologist, what is, at the NICU doc on Instagram. That's Tons right. of great information. Uh, we kind of, we teamed up before. It's been a minute, but I got a message why I contacted you, contacted you about this discussion. I got a message from a parent whose infant was diagnosed with RSV flu and COVID. And it was very scary. I didn't share this on Instagram. Look, the likelihood of any child that young having all three is probably very low, but it happens. And I was like, you know, I want to talk to Dr. Fort about all three because we're in season for all three, right? And we need to start, we need to talk about this. So you up for it? Absolutely, always. All right, good. So first start off, let's define what is a neonate, define what is an infant. Yep. So usually, uh, so neonates are defined essentially anything beyond the first 28, 30 days of life is uh, considered a neonate and infants all the way up to one year of age. So anything from birth all the way to one year infant and neonate again, first 28 days usually. And then after that, is there another age cutoff or is it just a child or? Then, then you or get no, well, toddler. So then the, the second uh, cutoff is toddlers, which is up to two years of age. Mm -hmm. And then you, uh, you, then you get children, essentially. Children, um, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So first year, neonate. Second year, year one to year two. Oh, sorry. Back up. First 30 days, neonate. Up to year one is an infant. And one to two is a toddler. Okay. That's correct. The first thing I want to talk about is RSV. Tell us what is RSV. So RSV, or uh, respiratory syncytial virus, syncytial virus, um, essentially, it's very, uh, it's a lot of these uh, things that we're going to be talking about, all of them are viruses, and they sort of, uh, the way they, the, that they're put into certain families is uh, depending on either how they were discovered or the way they look. And the reason why these, this respiratory syncytial is respiratory, obviously, affecting the respiratory part, the breathing part. Syncytial is, if you actually look into the cells through a microscope, uh, you can actually see they, they sort of form these little blobs inside uh, cells. So that's sort of the syncytial uh, part of things, and obviously virus with the virus. But it is uh, fairly common, and actually one of the most common reasons why children in general, and we're not talking about infants necessarily, but children in general get something called bronchiolitis, and mm -hmm. essentially being an inflammation or an infection of the a certain part of the airways or the little you know breathing pipes, if, if you will, uh, that take the air all the way to the lungs. So that's sort of the big picture. And I know we're going to go into details on some of mm -hmm. uh, these uh, when you, with some of these questions, but that's sort of big picture of what the RSV is. So is there a vaccine for RSV that is a, a regular childhood or infant vaccine? There is. There is a vaccine. Um, it's called Synergis. And this is a vaccine that prevents, it doesn't, again, no vaccine is really 100% effective, but it prevents or decreases the risk of developing uh, this RSV. Now, because in general, if you have a healthy child, the likelihood of severe or developing severe symptoms is fairly low. Most babies uh, develop symptoms that are very similar to a cold. They're cool. very mild usually goes away uh, really between seven to 10 days, like other colds. And so usually for healthy babies, nothing is necessarily needed. However, there's a category of babies where RSV can be very, very can make uh, babies very, very sick. And those are the babies that have lung disease. In my world, in the NICU, in the neonatal intensive care unit, we are talking about those babies that have bronchopulmonary dysplasia, BPD, or chronic lung disease as a big category. So lung disease, cardiac disease. So babies that have been born with a congenital defect, congenital heart disease, uh, mm -hmm. that have had surgery or a pre-surgery, they uh, can also receive this vaccine as they are higher risk. Neurological disease, 
if there's any mm -hmm. neurological seizures or any type of anatomical neurologic uh, disease or any other baby uh, or, or child that would have some type of a decreased immune system more so than just being a baby, uh, if for whatever reason you're under treatment that brings your immune system down, if you have a certain uh, immune, uh, genetic immune uh, disease that brings your system, immune uh, system down, those are the babies that can receive this vaccine. Okay. And you, you talked about it mostly being in the common cold, being the common cold for most children. But let's specifically talk about those one year and under, if they were to get RSV, Obviously, in the, the group of, of uh, people that you just mentioned that have underlying conditions, it would definitely be worse. But what's a typical presentation in an otherwise healthy neonate infant if they were to get RSV? Yeah, so most of the most of the things you'll see with RSV, again, you sort of equate that to a regular cold. Is the typical kind of runny nose, a little coughing, a little sneezing, uh, sort of upper airway respiratory problem. So again, you know, coughing being the most common and runny nose being the most common first presentation. Again, we're talking about mild presentations again for the majority, but these can get more severe. And one of the unique things and scary things about, about RSV occurs usually in babies less than six months and in reality less than four months. And that is where they can stop breathing. And it is one of the scariest things uh, for parents to, you know, obviously identify if a baby has stopped breathing, um, you know, bring them into the emergency room. And for us, you know, usually when they go, in these cases, they usually go to the intensive care unit, the pediatric intensive care unit, and you watch them. And some, unfortunately, have so many events that they need a breathing tube just to help them get through this disease. Now, the great, great news is that it doesn't affect the lungs necessarily long term. So as long as you mm -hmm. can help them get through these seven to 10 days where babies, again, yeah. you're two months, you're, you, you're not breathing by yourself, you get them over that, they're able to recover very well, go back to being regular, you know, happy babies and, and get to go home. But it is one of the scariest things uh, for baby, for parents to see their baby stop breathing. So from one, one of the stats, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that, that most kids by age two will have gotten RSV. And most of them would, you may not even know, it might just be a cold-like symptoms. Um, and, and although you talked about the very scary part of RSV, and I'm actually following a, a parent on TikTok right now whose child is going through it and is hospitalized. Mm -hmm. It is very scary. Um, you know, but again, like you said, most of the time it's, it's just a cold and they get over it. But say you are a parent at home and I, I was once a parent to preemie twins and they had, even though we were very, they were born September 26th. So we didn't really have visitors over. They still got little colds. Um, you know, I was working. So what would be some of the things that might be kind of warning signs or things that you definitely needed to call the doc for, or would need to go to the urgent care or the ER to have your, your baby evaluated? Yeah, one of the things uh, really that's uh, fairly unique about this type of virus, this RSV, is that uh, for the most part, in adults, you can actually carry uh, RSV and be completely asymptomatic. So you can have a visitor yeah. come by who is carrying the virus and pass it on to a baby. And we yeah. talked about, again, we're, we're focusing on those infants being at higher risk because of their immune system being lower. Um, and so, you know, you can carry it and, and not know it. For babies, though, again, for we're talking about less than two years of age and definitely less than one year of age, they all are symptomatic in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I, I, I agree with you. We have to emphasize because it's not about, you know, it's not a scared tactic thing. Most mm -hmm. babies are going to do very well. But some of the things that you really have to look out for, if you start with a little runny nose, that's fine. Uh, you watch that. If you start with a little coughing, that's fine. You watch that. With the signs that tell you you really need to talk to your doctor or God forbid you have to go to the emergency room are where you have such a degree of cough that mm -hmm. you have this ongoing cough that's getting worse that they're not really having any time to take to catch a nice breath. breath. Yeah. It could be other things. Is that that's not necessarily to say right. that you know this is it's RSV. To yeah. RSV. But, you know, you see that and that will be a clue that you need to talk to somebody or again, if it's we're coughing so much and now you're seeing changes in the skin color. So we talked mm -hmm. about we, we talk about this cyanosis or blue discoloration of the skin, especially in the area of the lips, no. the chest or definitely inside the mouth. 
you're seeing any changes there, that is definitely a call, an emergency call, go to the emergency room kind of thing, uh, because that means that the oxygen level is dropping. And that is something that we can see with RSV. Definitely have to you know, keep an eye on those things. The other thing they can develop is some fevers, but they tend to be sort of low-grade fevers. But it is also another reason just to call your pediatrician, let them know what's going on. Same thing for not eating very well. If we're really, usually it tends to be mild, but if we're not eating very well and we're not yeah. making a wet diaper the whole day, yeah, yeah. that's a sign of dehydration. That's one of the first things and one of the most common things uh, that can get babies into trouble and end up in the hospital for whatever reason, dehydration. They're, uh, in an adult, if you don't drink so much for a little bit, that's fine. Your kidneys yeah. can take care of it. But the kidneys of a baby, they're still a little bit young. They're still developing, and they don't hold on to water very well. So they can get dehydrated very quickly. So that is a reason definitely to call your pediatrician. And again, I mentioned some of the other things to go to the emergency room. Right. Okay, so great explanation, great review of RSV. Next, I want to skip to the flu. Let's start just like we did with RSV. What is the flu? Uh, and what are some, well, let's first stop. What is the flu? Yep. So the, the flu, commonly known as the flu, is essentially a virus uh, called influenza. And, uh, and this gets confused. There's another uh, organism called Haemophilus influenza, which is completely mm -hmm. different and, and, and leads to other you know, different complications, different mm -hmm. issues. So we really have to be talking about influenza specifically. Now, the difference between influenza and, uh, and RSV that we talked about is that influenza can usually happen very quickly, as, a, as opposed to RSV, where we're talking about this sort of slow progression. Yeah. We're seeing a little bit of snotty nose. It's getting a little bit worse. The coughing is getting a little bit worse. Influenza, you may have a baby who's mm -hmm. doing fine, and then, you know, starts with a little kind of, you know, I'm not feeling good, uh, feeling uh, not eating as well as it should. And then really quickly, within the first day or two, they can get, uh, you know, mm -hmm. substantially worse. And what does worse uh, mean for influenza? Usually it's, again, we talked about dehydration being the main thing. That is, you know, something that's very clear. General malaise, and malaise is sort of this medical term we use a lot, but just not feeling right. And that's usually the first thing you're going to hear when you have a parent take a baby to the emergency room. They come in and they say, I just don't know, but Johnny's not the same. You know, he's yeah. just not eating as well, you know, not making it with diapers. There's something about Johnny that's just not, not uh, as usual. And babies can actually get, you know, very sick uh, with influenza because what they can develop is a high fever. And that's something yeah. that's very different from RSV. And I know we're going to be talking about COVID and, and, and mm -hmm. that, but uh, high fever uh, of all the way, sometimes from anywhere from 103 to 105 uh, is, is something that we have to, you know, really watch out for because when you get a very quick increase and sometimes treating the fever, bringing that fever down too quickly will actually uh, trigger, especially in kids less than five years of age, a seizure, usually between mm -hmm. five months and five years or six months and six years. It's not anything that you did wrong. It's not anything that, you know, it's not the medication you gave. It has to do really nobody exactly mm -hmm. knows, but it has to do with sort of the changes in, in, in temperature and the inflammation uh, mm -hmm. that, that may be coming from that, uh, from that virus itself. But that's what happens when you have a high, high, high fever. And obviously, that would be an absolute reason to go to the emergency room with influenza. So we talked a little bit, and you can maybe lump the two together as far as RSV and flu and yeah. how, how it's most commonly spread. I got a DM from another person who had a, a child in a, a pre-K and got diagnosed with RSV. He almost had a cold, but then came home and gave it to the two-month-old. The two-month-old got really, really sick. So, yeah. you know, that's probably the most common. Like, how does it get spread back and forth or to those kids age two and under? Do you, is it usually from getting it exposed through an asymptomatic adult, through a sibling or another child? What is the most common ways to, that it's spread to these, this age group? Yeah, the actual spreading actually happens from droplets, meaning basically mm -hmm. any little um, piece of wet, substance most commonly is you know it's not it, it, it's not. you know mm -hmm. runny nose boogers uh mm -hmm. and things like that but a lot of it tends to be not you know no one's you know putting a tissue straight at, at, at a baby's hands a lot of it tends to be from either a sibling and that's the most common reason just because they're going to daycare they're seeing a lot yeah. of different kids in that age group and so a lot of it tends to be touching the face Run, you know, sneezing, coughing. You're maybe maybe a parent's actually cleaning the face of the sibling. 
and may forget to wash the hands and now is touching the baby. So a lot of this is actually transmission, not necessarily directly that a baby or a child sneezes onto a baby, but a lot of it is transmission through what I call fomites, or essentially yeah. you are leaving yeah. little droplets that are invisible. You don't know, but you mm -hmm. open the door and you know another adult comes in, touches that the, the doorknob and then holds the baby, even though they might've washed their hands. They didn't wash right before touching the baby, and now we're transmitting that infection to the baby. So that tends to be the most common thing. Play toys, um, you know, anything that you're touching, that you've, you've touched your face, you've picked up that virus, that virus, you're now passing it on to an object that eventually ends up passing yeah. it on to the baby. Now you talked about, and I just want to clarify to make sure I, I, get, I got this right. For RSV, the vaccine is not given to every child. It's given to those at risk, right? Correct. Okay, so for the flu vaccine, um, are, do, is every child eligible for a flu vaccine? If so, when? Yes, absolutely. And this is a, a, a very nice distinction. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, influenza or the flu vaccine is available for anybody. They're not necessarily those that have, you know, higher risk, not mm -hmm. anybody that's necessarily in the hospital. Every single child that's over six months of age is mm -hmm. eligible to get the flu shot. And why is this important? And in fact, obviously, with what you do, I would say mm -hmm. get it when you're pregnant, right? Because mm -hmm. really, if you want to protect your child, both, you know, with the vaccine of all family members, and also, again, if you have a lady that's pregnant, mm -hmm. you want to get that vaccine because unfortunately, babies less than six months of age cannot get the shot. But how do we protect them? If you're pregnant and you get that shot, you're going to pass those antibodies that you yeah. have produced with so much effort. You now pass that on to your baby. And it's been shown that it protects your mm -hmm. baby. Your antibodies protect your baby up to six to nine months of age. So, they, you know, yes, it'd be great if we could get a vaccine for less than six months, but that's okay yeah. because you, yeah. you're passing those antibodies. And same thing, if you've got siblings in the house and all the adults, mm -hmm. Uh, grandparents are going to be coming to visit or, mm -hmm. or you've got a caretaker. You want everybody to be vaccinated mm -hmm. because that's really what's going to protect the baby. I know all these things with COVID have come up and, and, and we're, we're talking about vaccines and so on and so forth. We pediatricians and neonatologists have been talking yeah. about protecting your baby with vaccines way before this whole yeah. Yeah. You know, COVID yeah. thing blew up. Uh, we've had <laughs> folks that have not been interested. We've had anti-vaxxers. You know, this is not new for, for any mm -hmm. of us. We're just really emphasizing yeah. this. And I know we'll talk about COVID in a minute, but definitely yeah. for flu mm -hmm. is something that you really, really want to do to protect your baby because it's rare. And, and, and again, God forbid it happens. It's rare, but babies can die from mm -hmm. the flu. So mm -hmm. you really want to protect everybody. Make sure you protect that little baby one. Yeah, so I'll just talk a little bit about the flu vaccine in pregnancy. It is recommended every season uh, for everyone, but when you're pregnant, you can get the flu vaccine. Uh, you can get it at any trimester. Um, some seasons are worse than others as far as how affected a pregnant woman or individual might be. Um, back when H1N1 hit, what was it, 2009, it really, really hit pregnant individuals, and they were very, very sick, lots of intubated, uh, intubated patients. Since then, we haven't had a flu season quite that bad, but you never know. It depends on which the predominant uh, str strain of the flu is going around. But still, at baseline, pregnant individuals we know are, are predisposed to having increased severity and morbidity mortality from the flu if they get it while they're pregnant. So that's why we recommend, uh, usually the earliest the flu vaccine is available is late September, early October. We recommend vaccination then no matter when you are pregnant, if it's first, second, or third trimester. Um, and then that does still, even if you get it in the first trimester, that does still help to protect baby for when baby's born. But we still have to protect the pregnant individual first and foremost, because if you get it, I mean, it's not gonna be good for, for baby. So, yeah. you know, you get the vaccine to protect you um, and it does p pass on those protective antibodies. I know my, like I said, my twins were born September 26th. Uh, I had the, I, I can't remember exactly if I was able to get the vaccine right before, I probably wasn't able to afterwards, but before yeah, my parents close, came, right? yeah. yeah, I think it was probably after, before my parents came, before, you know, anybody came and we didn't have a whole lot of people, but they all got the flu vaccine, they all got the Tdap booster, that was a requirement. 
Um, and so, you know, that does help to protect, uh, especially I had preemie twins at home. So that was even yeah. more important. So you did talk about, you know, that it's possible that babies and those under two and under one can die from the flu, although thankfully it's very rare. But are there certain uh, things that make infants at more increased risk for getting severity of disease when it comes to the flu? Yes, I mean, and this is not only just for the flu, but obviously any virus, and again, this, this is why pediatricians have been talking about this for a while. Any, any baby that's yeah. less than one month, uh, sorry, one year of age, so any infant, and you can even extend that up to two years, to be honest, but we'll definitely just kind of focus on the infant, less than one year of age. They do have a decreased immune system. And mm -hmm. so this is why we have to be much more careful and do the things that we have to do as adults. You know, every parent is always there to protect their child and they want to know how can I protect, what can I do to keep my child safe? And those are the things, knowing that your baby's less than one, one year of age, you really want to do the extra things because the immune system is lower, because babies can get sicker with mm -hmm. viruses that maybe for an older child, an adult, a sibling who has just a little runny nose and they're fine, they go back to school, that baby may actually get very sick, may end mm -hmm. up being in the hospital. and in most cases, that's sort of the worst case scenario. We talked about death being so rare, but it's very traumatic to have yeah. your baby in the hospital. Even if it's for two to three days, that's very traumatic for a lot mm -hmm. of parents. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's not just about talking about the worst case scenario death situation. Yeah, yeah. Even just having a baby in the hospital where we're having to do procedures, where we're having to do a lot yeah. of things to make sure that the baby's safe. That's really tough on babies, but definitely a lot for the parents too. Yeah, so the best thing to do is to get all those adults vaccinated around them, uh, especially during the flu season until they're able to get vaccinated at, at six months. And I, my twins are born at 31 weeks and they still at six months, they got their flu vaccine on, as scheduled because they, they are other, otherwise healthy uh, preemies. So, you know, that's one thing to, to consider. Um, yeah, and you know, there's, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and if you don't, uh, let me add one more thing too. And, and I don't know if you were going to ask me about this. Hopefully, I didn't interrupt. But, you know, the other thing is actually treatment for the flu shot. And I don't know if you were going to get into that. But, you know, that's another thing. In, in certain cases, your pediatrician may decide if you have an, a, you know, a sibling that clearly has now been diagnosed with influenza and you have a baby that's less than one year of age, your pediatrician may decide, look, you know, we, we want to go ahead and treat and we can use a medication called oseltamivir. And, mm -hmm. and there are three other type of antivirals, but that's the most commonly used, especially because you can use it down to even two weeks of age as treatment. Um, so sometimes we'll, the pediatricians will actually give that medication, not because it actually um, will do that much to the yeah. child or the adult, but it's more so to protect the baby. Uh, what it does is basically decreases how severe the symptoms are. So that five-year-old, you know, may have some, some severe symptoms. So it decreases the risk of severe symptoms. And it also decreases the timing. So mm -hmm. the less days that baby is exposed to this virus, the better. And so that is something that your pediatrician, if they decide to treat it, again, we're all for making sure that your baby is safe and follow their recommendations on treatment. Yeah, I remember so they're five when they were three. Um, the day my sister and her one year old flew in from Kentucky, the twins got diagnosed with the flu. Oh. And there was nothing I could do. She was coming. Yeah. The baby was there. And of course, I was, oh no, but I will tell you, we kept them separated. We were very conscientious about it. They were there all weekend. The baby never got it. So it is possible. The twins were taking Tamiflu and they were, you know, not too sick. Uh, yeah. I mean, it wasn't ideal. I wish they could have played, but, you know, it is what it is. It happens. And they're, you know, even in a worst case scenario where you have other kids at home, it still can be done. Uh, I mean, it took a little bit of work, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, uh, we did have to separate them and even the adults because we had to be careful. Exactly. We have three kids now under three. We can't be interacting like nothing's going on. And then they go to bedtime, you know, so we had to separate, you know, we were in the same home. We didn't have any, you know, couldn't do anything. And we still, everybody, you know, was fine. Um, so, you know, it's just about being, taking precautions and things like that happen. It was out of our control. I did not expect that to happen. Um, but, you know, being very conscientious about it and taking those precautions, it definitely made a difference. So it does work. I'm, I can attest to that because I was <laughs> there for a little bit. Um, okay. So 
let's talk about, and then one thing that the, all three of these have, RSV, flu, COVID, is the lungs. You know, yeah. a lot of them, they affect the lungs. And, uh, you know, COVID right now, same situation as RSV. We don't have a vaccine that's available for our, all kids age two and under, especially age one and under. So let's talk about the first, the myth of the century, well, maybe that's the century, that kids can't get sick from COVID. Is that true? Yeah, so absolutely not. And uh, of course, you know, we do know, and this is the true part of things, we do know that kids get less uh, infections. They tend to um, not get as infected. So we're talking about not only the number, there tend to be less than adults, but actually the severity. So they, can, they tend to be less uh, infected. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they don't get it, number one, and that they don't pass it along to others. So these are two mechanisms that are important to talk about. Because for the ones that get it, they tend to be very mild, if anything. Actually, most babies are asymptomatic. So if you look at a baby who actually has symptoms of COVID, most of them actually don't have COVID. And if you look at babies that actually do and are tested positive for COVID, most of them don't have symptoms, mm -hmm. okay? But that doesn't mean that they can't pass it to another. So we're talking about twins, triplets. We're talking about a sibling. So, yeah. you know, a, a, a asymptomatic sibling could definitely pass it on to the baby. Now, again, we most of them are mild. If they're going to have symptoms, they tend to be mild. Some babies have been admitted to the hospital and they tend to stay maybe for a day or two, usually dehydration. Yeah. Again, we bring that back. You know, it, that's the most common reason why babies get hospitalized. The second most common is oxygen drops. You talked about it, uh, affecting the, the lungs. Well, it can inflame the lungs. There are a lot of these um, yeah. viruses, it's about inflaming the lungs, which then, you know, causes a little bit of, you know, areas of pus pockets, a lot of cells, yeah. a lot of debris, and that makes oxygen harder to get in. So sometimes they need a little extra oxygen. But unfortunately, sometimes there are babies that get so sick that they yeah. have to require an intensive care unit. They have to, re they, they require a breathing tube to breathe and God forbid a small percentage, but you know, up to even 700 babies during this yeah. whole pandemic uh, yeah. uh, have actually you know, died from infection, from the COVID-19 infection. So of course, extremely rare, but you just don't ever want to risk your child. And that's mm -hmm. why we talk about this to protect them. Yeah. And, and, you know, so again, and we'll hit on the vaccination point, the safest way to protect, protect a neonate infant child under two, any child uh, right now, we can vaccinate at age five and up, which my twins are signed up to go in a week or two. Um, Same. So, right. As soon as I it came out, I got them an appointment right away. And, you know, uh, vaccination uh, in pregnancy and lactation against COVID-19 is recommended by ACOG. Uh, SMFM, and even the booster. And I've talked about that extensively here. I'm not going to go into it because you can get all that information here. It is recommended. The thing that we do know, the uh, anti-COVID antibodies are found in umbilical cord blood, which means that if a pregnant individual is vaccinated in pregnancy and uh, antibodies are in the cord blood, that means it's the, in the baby. Um, we also know we get antibodies in breast milk, which goes to baby. The only thing we don't know is how protective uh, those vaccines are yet yeah, because I mean we've been in two years we have a lot more data on the flu for example the flu uh, vaccine um, and how protected they are for how long so as a result and we've talked about this before are kids under two still considered high-risk individuals for COVID infection just we talked about this maybe six months ago has anything changed yeah. regarding that yeah well the, the one thing is that you know we do consider them in general, for as I mentioned already, you know, any baby that's less, that's, le that's less than two and definitely less than one, we do know their immune system is lower. And so therefore, infants are really considered high risk, like if they had, like if you had an older child or an, even an adult with low immune system, either because of treatment or because of certain disease. So we, we've talked about the symptoms of RSV, we talked about the symptoms of flu. Uh, they probably all three, now I want to ask, talk about COVID, they probably all three overlap to some degree. Uh, yeah. And we're not, the purpose of this conversation is not to teach you as a parent so you can no diagnose the kid at home. It's, it's just to educate. Um, but the bottom line is what Dr. Ford's talking about is the things that would make you need or, you know, say, you know, you need to be seen, the kid needs to go to the ER, the urgent care. Um, and we talked about some of those signs. 
Now, is there anything specific or different about signs of COVID-19 and a child or an infant less than one or, or a child, uh, toddler less than two that's different from the other two RSV and flu? Yeah, I, I, again, you know, I don't know that, that this is necessarily a difference, but maybe okay. uh, the timing of this. And this okay. is fever. So with okay. the other two, you tend to see more of the, again, we talk about RSV with a runny nose. You know, uh, mm -hmm. we talk about the, you know, flu or influenza, a little bit of general malaise. You can have diarrhea. You can have nausea, not wanting to eat. Well, the, one of the first signs that we see and, and one of the most common signs that we see with COVID-19 is a fever. Uh, usually, uh, and depending again where you are in the world, it's usually 100 degrees or 100.5 uh, degrees uh, Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius is considered a fever. Most babies that develop a fever, they have low grade fevers, meaning we talked about sort of the extreme with influenza giving you a high grade fever, that 103 to 105. With uh, COVID, it tends to be more in the low 100. So we're talking about over 100.5. 101, 101.5, low-grade fever. Now, in general, when babies get low-grade fever, that leads to everything else that you can see in some of the other uh, viruses, which is not wanting to eat, not feeling mm. great, uh, not wanting to eat and not feeling great also then causes dehydration. So that's sort of, you know, the, the, the downstream effect. But it is interesting, again, that you don't tend to see the runny nose. You don't tend to see sneezing in COVID-19. You do see cough. Uh, you know, appear. So either you get that cough come first or you get the fever come first. And uh, again, these are all, we're playing the numbers here. Every baby is obviously different. Yeah. So you may have a baby that doesn't have a fever who could have COVID-19 and they have some diarrhea. But sort of mm -hmm. using the, the statistics of numbers, fever is the most common uh, presenting sign. And then with that comes sort of dehydration, cough uh, within that, within those uh, symptoms. Yeah. Um, so along the antibody, you know, people ask this a lot too, about having natural infection of COVID and the antibodies, are they protective? Like if you are pregnant and you got COVID, are you passing antibodies? The answer is yes. We've seen antibodies from natural infection to COVID being in the core blood. And the same thing for lactation. The only difference is, is that the immune response is not the same, meaning that we have shown that uh, the immune response is generated after vaccination is much more what we call robust than having natural infection. Um, and that's why we still recommend, and even in pregnancy, if you've had COVID infection, you do still get vaccinated once you're asymptomatic and out of the quarantine period. So the same thing goes for uh, pregnancy and, and lactation period as well to help protect not only yourself, but you know it's protective of the, 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 the baby, the neonates and the newborns um, once they're born. So that's something to touch on too. I, I, people ask me a lot, well, I say I've had COVID infection, I'm fine. That's not what the data show, and I, I'm, we're not going to belabor that. It's still recommended by all med major medical or organizations, including ACOG and SMFM, that even if you've had COVID in, in pregnancy and or lactation, that you still get the, the, the COVID vaccine. Now, the big question of the day is, and you touched on this a little bit, you know, this is a season of RSV flu and COVID. What are the best protective measures that outside of vaccinating for what you can get vaccinated for as, an, as, as, as right. someone, as an adult in the house, and that's for the flu and COVID, what are some other protective measures that parents can take to decrease the chance that their child under one or under two uh, will get uh, one of those three? Yeah, and, and uh, I'll answer that with also adding, because I've, I've had several followers ask about this. I have a child, mm -hmm. I have an older child or a sibling who has RSV. How can I protect my baby? who may be a few months old yes. from him or her getting it. So uh, I'll, I'll follow that. And, and also yeah. that goes in with people visiting. So you've got, yeah. if you have a grown up who's uh, coming in, let's, let's kind of bundle all that together to answer sure. this. The number one thing really, if you have somebody who's, ace, who's symptomatic, who's actually having symptoms, whether it's an adult, especially if they're not living in the same household, the best thing to do is just tell them very kindly and gently, look, now is not a good time to visit me. I, you know, I love you, your dad, mom, whatever it is, but please get over your cold first because I, I don't know what it is. And, you know, let's keep my, my baby safe. So especially if they're coming to visit. If you've got a sibling, what you want to try and do, and this goes for everything, is anytime you're getting within that six feet, you're getting close to uh, the baby, especially if you're going to touch them, you want to wash your hands. You want to wash your hands 
for that 20 seconds and you can you know sing the happy birthday song twice i think is what what, what they mm-hmm. usually mm-hmm. recommend um and uh, unless you're a latino we speak so fast you might want to <laughs> sing it three times. but um you know you want to wash your hands well before you touch and also after and a lot of people ask well why would you do it after you touch the baby because we talked about this babies most of the time tend to be asymptomatic so it actually could be that the baby is the carrier for COVID-19, it, yeah. for, you know, flu, again, RSV, all babies will present something, but for some of any other virus. And now, you know, because you haven't washed your hands after touching the baby, you may now be taking that to your six-year-old, to your four-year-old. So you want to also before and after, you know, wash your hands. The other thing is to disinfect the whole area of the house. Now, you don't have to be all, you know, cleaning every single spot every single time, but the most common areas doorknobs being the most common areas in the kids uh, rooms you might be cleaning the 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 toys you know before uh, or sorry after they play with them if your baby is going to be in that environment and, and holding and touching you know obviously if you've got a one month old still in your crib that that you know you don't need to do that unless that baby will be playing with that toy so you want to sort of disinfect everything wash your hands before and after and avoid anybody that's sick if at all possible You've got a child who obviously wants to hold that baby or wants to have some time with that baby. Again, you want to go ahead and wash your hands. We still do recommend if that if there is a possible concern if that child is not vaccinated uh, for with uh, COVID uh, nineteen or really the SARS CoV two uh, uh, vaccine, we still do recommend to best if they can mask uh, until they get that vaccine. And again, hopefully we'll get the vaccine even down to six months as soon as we can get it. Yeah, yeah. And let's, since you talk about masks, let, let's just touch on why we're not recommending that children under two wear a mask. Yeah, so uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm about to publish a paper on that with, with a group uh, from, mm. from uh, actually all over the world. We have a, a group mm. of, of our uh, researchers and we have people in England and Australia to actually do, it's taken us so long because every country has their own mandate. And in certain yeah. areas, I think in England, they talked about uh, you cannot mask anybody below 12 years of age. So there is mm-hmm. such a huge, huge variation, the, yeah. the lowest essentially mm-hmm. down to yeah. two years of age. But the big, the, the, the gist of this is two things. Number one, it, there are some studies showing that there is increased risk for less than ba- babies less than two years of age of suffocation. They're not able to, you know, uh, remove the mask if they were to have an event where they need to breathe mm-hmm. better for whatever reason, or there's uh, actually studies showing that there's an increased uh, risk of CO2 of that exhaled air from accumulating when you are wearing masks, especially in less than two years of age. The trachea, which is the main feeding, uh, uh, breathing pipe, is much, much thinner, much, mo- much smaller yeah. in radius than it is in an older child. So very uh, sometimes small changes can make a big difference to the physiology of how much mm-hmm. oxygen they can get in and so on and so forth. The second part of this is all the hand touching that a child less than two years will do. And this is why, you know, a lot of followers have, have asked yeah. me, well, my, my child is two years and a half. Should I do it? And I basically, the answer is, does, if your child is really uncomfortable and is taking the mask off all day or is playing with the face, with yeah. the, you know, then, then it's not helping at all. Yeah. So it's really about, you know, trying to minimize the contact of your airway, your yeah. nares, and, and all the things where you're going to pick up those droplets and take yeah. it to another child. Um, and so less than two years of age, they're just not developmentally uh, um, developed enough to be able to uh, know that this is a good thing for them. And therefore, I'm not going to touch my face if my mom says I should yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's go. I'm going to go take you through some scenarios. Since the big question is always visitors, and then also what to do in the home. So we have a child, uh, say under two, um, but especially under one. Um, they cannot be vaccinated against COVID. Now they can get vaccinated against the flu, age six months and up. Uh, the flu vaccine, we're going to assume that all adults and everybody else that can get the flu vaccine can get the flu vaccine. Uh, so we're going to kind of gear this towards the, towards the COVID. Um, you have a home, you have two parents, they're vaccinated against the flu, they're vaccinated uh, against COVID, but they have a, a neonate or a child under one, and they have another child that may be four that's not eligible to get the vaccine yet. Yep. What do they, how can they protect, because that child's going to pre-K, 
what how are they going to protect and that the smaller child because they're like am i supposed to mask my child what do you know what do i do all right that that's not reasonable um again again i want to emphasize i'm i'm gearing this this what we're going to do towards the fact that we're ex assuming that parents are vaccinated against what they can be vaccinated which would be the flu and COVID. okay so now we have this child that's four cannot get the covid vaccine but has had the flu vaccine we could still get the, you know, potentially get COVID. Well, how do you tell parents to help protect that neonate or infant? Yeah, the main thing is sort of teaching, and this is good for anything, but for children, just teaching them good hand hygiene. And this is something that they should learn regardless of yeah. COVID pandemic. It's just really good for, for children um, to, to learn that. So the first thing I usually, I would say as a pediatrician is as that child is coming from that daycare, that school, the first thing that they, that you want to get them to do every single time and, and, and have them kind of learn this as a habit is to go wash your hands. And so you immediately go, you do your 20 you know, seconds of hand washing. And then really beyond that, unless they're symptomatic, and I'll mention that in a second, but beyond that, if they don't have any symptoms, they're free to mm -hmm. be around the house and jump around and, and, and be kids. Now, what happens if we are symptomatic? That's where the adult, both the adult and the child need to really play together because you wanna not only, and by the way, I should have mentioned, when you're washing that four-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old's hands, you're washing yours as well. Yes. Uh, because kids will learn. And so if yeah. they see that you're washing your hands, they'll know, oh, I, I have to do this because mommy's been doing that. They're, they have that social learning. Uh, but this is going to be really important now when we talk about that child who may be coming from daycare who is symptomatic. Every child, especially within the first couple of years, they say you can have up from, from 15 to 20 uh, viruses yeah. during the whole year. So that's telling you that pretty much there's a few months there where you're going to be going on with mm -hmm. snotty noses. Mm -hmm. And we know there, we've, I, I got two kids, I've been there. Yeah. Um, and so this, it's really common for children to come in with runny nose, uh, rhinorrhea. So you get them to wash your hands, but then you also help them clean that. So you may actually teach your child, if they're old enough, to go ahead and blow their nose, clean them, yeah. clean their, their, their noses, and then throw that away in an area where, again, you're going to be, that's different from where you're throwing your diapers, different yeah. from where you, you want to, you know, make sure that that's separate from anything that you're going to be doing with the baby. And then they wash their hands and you wash your hands as well. So you go through that process to try and minimize. Remember, always just kind of visually see this sort of virus in your hands as they come in and you got to wash that off. If they're approaching now and holding and they want to hold that child, this is where it kind of gets a little bit tricky with the yeah. whole, you know, COVID-19 with, with SARS-CoV-2. So at first, because there was a lot of fear and nobody knew what was going on, there was a strong recommendation for children to wear masks uh, if they were unvaccinated in front of their babies. Now, after all this, there is now the recommendation, so mm -hmm. there is the suggestion that mm -hmm. if you really want to do absolutely everything to protect your child, uh, your baby, I should say, then you have your child wear a mask. If you yourself are going all day, every single day to work and you really want to yeah. protect your baby, that's the best, that's the, you know, the, most, uh, the best way to protect your child. Uh, your baby from getting COVID-19, but you can, just with the hand washing and without a mask, you can now hold uh, your child if we're talking about the household. We're not talking about visitors yeah. from outside. We're talking about people that live in your in household in that sort of your own community, if you will. But the, again, the best thing to do is for those in the household who are eligible for the vaccine to get them. That would Definitely. be the flu and COVID vaccine. Definitely. So now let's go into visitors. Uh, I still get questions about, you know, it's usually parents in law that the issue is around, or and sometimes friends, but mostly in laws. Uh, they yeah. want to come uh, visit, uh, but they're not vaccinated. You know, I know I understand the dilemma there, and you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Uh, but what would be the recommendation if we weren't about hurting feelings? If we weren't, yeah. you know, considering hurting feelings, what would be the recommendation if someone was to come visit from another household? You have a, ne a neonate infant at home. We're now in flu, RSV, COVID season. What would be your recommendation uh, regarding unvaccinated visitors? 
Yeah, and again, I'll have to emphasize this, but the first thing you should always have is a very hard-to-hard -hard conversation mm -hmm. uh, with that visitor about vaccinating, about vaccinating for the flu. We've been talking about this for years as pediatricians. Um, so this should not come as a surprise to anybody in the community, but unfortunately it's become politicized. But we, it's important to make sure you do everything. So you have to have a heart to heart to say, look, I understand that, that you don't want this for yourself. I really get it. But I want you to do what's best for my child and my, you know, my infant. And so that would be hard, strong emphasis to please get it done. But again, let's talk about scenarios where you really can uh, get that done for whatever reason that visitor uh, does not want to do that. And you still want to have that time and bonding because bonding is extremely important. Mm -hmm. so, but what's the safest way to do that in those kind of scenarios is for the visitor, for the grandparent or the in-law, whatever it is, to come outside of the house, to be in an environment where you are open to, uh, to open yeah. air, if you will, yeah. because that allows, because we talked about droplets and the reason yeah. why we discuss six feet it's not just a random number, but it's basically there's a certain percentage of the, the greatest percentage of droplets. Droplets, again, being kind of, think of it as little tennis balls uh, where they're inside, they're carrying the virus. Mm. Well, they're, they, ha they carry weight. And about six feet is where the great majority of these tennis balls, if you will, will fall to the ground and won't reach the next person. If you're outside, and where there's wind, where there's air, then those droplets are probably going to be blown away and yeah. decreasing the risk that they're going to be carried on to the next person. So that would be the way to do it. You would then also have them mask um, if they're getting too close to, or if they're getting close to contact. Again, we talk about hand washing. Uh, you know that that is always a must. You, you might want to make sure you yeah, bring in an yeah. alcohol, uh, you know, a, a sanitizer, 99% that is able to eliminate all these viruses we're talking about. So you want to go ahead and use that. And if you're talking about holding with an unvaccinated person, you want them to wear a mask, even if it's outside. And I know that's not what they want, but this is the, what you have to do to protect your baby. If you were to get that, uh, that grandparent or you were to get that visitor to vaccinate, they can not only be inside the house, but again, best, especially if, they're, if, if they may be working outside a lot, you also want to sit them in an area where there's a lot of, uh, there's open air, if you will. So they can be inside, mm -hmm. open the windows a little bit, have the, their, you know, there be more uh, airflow into the house to, again, try and prevent that from going. But they can be, again, best way to protect, mask. But if you wish, if they're vaccinated, and every other is vaccinated, you can take that mask off. Yeah, the whole masking thing with vaccinated visitors is always a question because of the fact that people can be vaccinated and still have COVID. And yes, we are definitely acknowledging that that can happen. Um, and it, so it's up to your comfort level as the parent. Um, but asking a vaccinated visitor, no matter who they are, if they're coming inside your home and having contact, direct contact with your baby, asking them to mask is not unreasonable. But again, that's something, even vaccinated, that's something that you have to decide what your comfort level is with that individual. Um, the, the only thing that I've heard is that, you know, you don't know what their exposure has been, even as a vaccinated individual. You know, I, my husband and I are both vaccinated and boosted, and we still wear masks when we go out in public, uh, you know, no matter where we go, a grocery yep. store everywhere, and there's no mask mandate in Texas right now. But, you know, I'm probably the most protected out of most people I'm around in the yep. grocery store, but I still have, my twins are not vaccinated, even afterwards, we will still continue this. But that's yep. a personal decision we've made as a family. So, you know, it, you know, you just kind of have to decide how you want to be and being overly cautious is okay. Uh, I think and, people are made to feel guilty for being overly cautious. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I always, I, you know, the, the way I use examples uh, for, for families is essentially using a seatbelt. And, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, a car accident, you can, uh, bad things can happen when you're wearing a seatbelt in a car accident. But the likelihood that in a car accident, there's going to be a, a severe outcome is a lot less if you're wearing your seatbelt than if you're not. And some of the overprotective, if you will, measures, we're talking about it, even if you're vaccinated, you're coming in, you're wearing your mask, you're washing your hands. Some people may consider that overprotective. But again, if you're in a race car, you don't wear just the one yeah. seatbelt. 
you wear your strap everything everywhere. yeah yeah and that's yeah. what we that's what happened when we were in the pandemic we were in a race car we were seeing you know up to half a million people dying uh, mm -hmm. around the world so we were yeah. in that race car we needed to overprotect ourselves because we also didn't know you know what what this was all about so Things are beginning to change. I'm, I, I'm, I am hopeful. I am seeing, and I, I, I don't know what the numbers are in Texas. We're here in Florida. It's mm -hmm. nice to see that numbers come down. I have actually talked and seen a lot of people, a lot of parents going to get vaccinated yeah. who didn't want to before, mm -hmm. but because they heard now children are getting sick. That's, yeah. and it's kind of sad that it kind of took that extra mm -hmm. oomph for people, for adults yeah. to go. But now when it started affecting their children at school, or if it didn't affect the child, but they were sent home every two weeks because yes. they were in contact, Exposed. they yes. were exposures, right? So mm -hmm. they were having to lose, you know, go out of their jobs yeah. every other week. So they got their child vaccinated. Mm -hmm. They vaccinated themselves just to end that. And you know what? Mm -hmm. Whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we are seeing the numbers come down. And, and I love it. It, it really does. Uh, give hope that there is a better future coming soon. Yeah, I, I just think, and I just want to emphasize, especially to those that are pregnant or trying to conceive or, you know, have neonates at home, uh, even though things look better right now, this is still a very tenuous season because of flu, COVID, RSV. We can't let our guard down yet. I think one, once we get through this season and we see what happens, because I'm still worried about another wave personally, uh, yeah. But, you know, I think once we get on the other end of this winter, depending on how it goes, we may be starting to see a change. Um, that's when I might breathe a little bit easier. Uh, right now, I'm still on, I'll be honest with you, I'm still on guard, uh, even as a vaccinated yeah. individual. And uh, because we are in, in a, a very worrisome season coming up. And so I, yeah. I still don't think we should, we still should, should, should still be very cautious. Correct. Um, Correct. And so, it may, and again, maybe I, it's just me. I feel like once we get past the winter and things start, starts getting into yeah. spring, if things are still kind of stable, then I might be like, okay, we might be getting Yeah, somewhere. especially if you got little ones at home. I mean, you, yeah. you just don't want to yeah. put them at risk. Not, not that, yeah. you know, and when I say put them at risk, it's not just the children, right? But yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if you get sick and you end up in the hospital, mm -hmm. uh, that is a, is a big deal for your kids. And, and sometimes a lot of families have said, gosh, I don't want to fight with my parents. I don't want to fight with my, you know, grandparents or whatever. Uh, but, you know, it's not just that. It's very traumatic if yeah. a child ends up in the hospital. So it is traumatic to have a strong discussion with your families. It is way more traumatic if you end up with a child in the hospital or even worse. A parent or a parent, like you said, a parent in the hospital or yeah, losing a parent. Exactly which we won't go into that. We'll just touch on it. You know, no. the number of or kids that have been orphaned from losing one or both parents is staggering. And it, it is, it is an issue. So, you know, we still yeah. have to think about that too, that we don't want yeah. ourselves to get sick and our children to be left without a, one or both parents. So that's something to consider as well. All right. We got about seven more minutes here. I'm going to go through and see if there's any questions. Well, there's a lot of people. Let's see. Yes, this is recorded. It's, it'll be in my feed. It'll under, also be under my COVID um, series under my Instagram TV. So you can watch this uh, whenever, you, whenever you have time. Thank you, everybody, for the hearts. We appreciate it. Okay, so this person says, I always thought Synergis was not a vaccine by definition. Never researched it. But if you could clarify, that would be great so I can use proper terminology. Do you know where they're going with that question? I I'm not sure. don't. Um... Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, well, it's, it's, it's essentially sort of an antibody kind of uh, a situation. So it's not, um, I guess, with everything that's come out with mRNA uh, vaccination and the production of, of, of vaccines, um, I don't know if that's what they're getting at. It's not yeah, I'm not like sure. The, it's not like the mRNA uh, vaccination that we're doing. It's more of an, it, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's more of an antibody uh, mediated um, yeah. Vaccine. Yeah. 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 It? It's a little bit, it's a little, a little bit different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. 
other questions? Yeah. Actually, I think everybody was listening to it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, Canada is having a lot of kids with RSV. What's it, yeah. what's it been like for RSV for you guys? Yeah, no, that's the thing. It's, it's, uh, there, there was, because everybody was being so incredibly careful, RSV was really yeah. low. And then now yeah. as the world has opened up again, there was a huge spike in RV, RSV to a point where normally we have a few months where Synergist is put into place and is given to, the, to, to babies. They pr- practically let that go the whole year because, mm-hmm. you know, it's still out there in the community. So mm-hmm. it's it, it basically very, very rampant right now. That's what they're seeing a lot more in the emergence rooms now. Okay, so here's a question. Regarding RSV, is there usually a day when things could turn worse? My five-month-old has it now and has had it for about five days. Are we out of the woods? She has had a fever but hasn't had it for two days. Yeah, usually your RSV is uh, something that's more of a seven to 10 day kind of thing. However, it can last up to a couple of weeks. Uh, usually around the day four or five is the worst day because there's a lot of inflammation. Uh, so you're probably right at that stage. I guess you could have a day or two more where it could get a little bit worse, yeah. uh, but you're sort of at that area of peak uh, inflammation and irritation. Uh, if you okay. do see some fever, you can treat with some Tylenol uh, if you need to sort of help help them overcome that. It won't change the inflammation part of things. So you can still get, you know, some of the scary things we talked about, but at least it kind of helps them feed better, eat better, and, and stay away from that dehydration part of things. Yeah. Question. Parents are vaccinated. So I'm assuming the parents in the home are vaccinated. They have a nine month old yep. baby, two toddlers. Do you recommend to vaccinate the toddlers for flu to protect the baby? I'm going to guess the answer to that question is absolutely. <laughs> Always. Always. Yeah. I think that's really smart, yeah. right? We talk about yeah. herd yeah. immunity and protecting yeah. you, you basically have a little shield around the baby yeah. if everybody in the household is vaccinated yep. absolutely yeah love it great question mm-hmm. that's great that saw a lot it. of hearts maybe it. We, we a lot of hearts yeah no this, this guy that, okay fair we go. baby is coming on wednesday and my toddler has rsv what precautions should we take so today is friday Baby's coming on Wednesday and the baby has RSV. Yeah, so actually, I, I, I think I know that lady who uh, she, she texted me yeah. before uh, uh, oh, we yeah. came on. So uh, thank you for answering, for asking that question. So it, essentially, it's the same thing we, we've talked about for any other virus. You want to make sure you do your really good hand washing. So as your baby's coming home, you're going to want to make sure that you have, you know, for, firstly, baby proof your home. And that's just kind of general baby mm-hmm. stuff. But uh, from a from a uh, you know virus standpoint, if there's uh, since your child is is has this virus, you want to make sure you're cleaning, you're disinfecting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you really want to clean all surfaces, all toys, everything before your baby gets home. Once we are home, you're going to be watching washing your hands, you, your your child, uh, and and the whole family or everybody in the household washing your hands constantly for mm-hmm. 20 seconds before and then after you're holding your baby. That's really the best way to, to, to protect your baby and then just keep an eye on for symptoms. Remember, RSV, all babies are symptomatic, but luckily most are mild, most just some runny nose, maybe a little coughing. You're gonna really wanna watch out for things where you change yeah. the color of your skin to be even kind of blue. That means your oxygen level is dropping uh, or you're coughing too much, you're not eating, you're getting dehydrated. Those are the things to watch out for. Yeah, and, and, and as parents, you know, and I went through this too, uh, until I got the hang of things and I got to know my babies, I was at the pediatrician's office or the urgent care all the time. I was because I was scared. And, you know, then I learned that with each visit I went, I learned this is, you know, and, and, and that's okay. That's okay. Don't feel bad um, that you're, <laughs> I'm, t- I'm not even kidding you. I think but the first year we were probably there at least twice a month. I mean, we were there. As a pediatrician, I, like, I took my, you know, my first child twice to the emergency room yeah. because I was concerned about meningitis and dehydration. Mm-hmm. And to my own, you know, professors who had taught me in the emergency room, and they would look at me and i say, I promise she was a lot worse at home. So, yes, even <laughs> yes. having all this knowledge. <laughs> yeah, having, I and mean, I, look, I, I did. And so for those of you guys that don't have a medical background, we get it. It's fine. Yeah. It's better to be on the safe side than not. Uh, the only thing is that every pediatrician's office, every urgent care is going to have their guidelines yeah. simply because of COVID. So just be aware of that. So you know who can, you can go with and who, you know, how many visitors they can have when you go. Um, so, you know, it's okay. 
to be mm-hmm. uh, worried. It's okay to ha- uh, need to get checked out. Um, in fact, it's better to do that than to wait too long, especially right now. And with the little ones, especially under one. Thank you, Dr. Fort. I really appreciate that you have such a good conversation every time we were on. It's How been a pleasure, find- always. <laughs> How can people find you on Instagram? Yeah, so you can look me up at, uh, you know, the NICU doc. Uh, both I'm on Instagram with at the NICU doc. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel, the NICU doc, where I put a lot. I have over, I think, 50 videos on all, Perfect. you know, topics related to the NICU. So I'm also on Facebook. You can also go to my webpage, www.thenikidoc.com. So, you know, just everywhere. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. And we will put this video on um, my feed. Um, so you can, if you, there's any other questions and you want to drop, Dr. Fort's actually very good about going and checking and answering questions. So sure thank you will. for your time. Are, do you, are you thank off you, this Dr. weekend Clark. or do you, or do you have to work this weekend? Uh, no, I'm off this weekend. Thank you. <laughs> me, me, <laughs> yeah. me too. Me too. So I'm Yay. Weekend. my kids are probably have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. You too. Take care. Good seeing you. Bye. Bye.